also sorry about uh, uh, sitting in the dark. I'm, I'm moving house at the moment. So uh, <laughs> this is why I have a, a bit of a, uh, uh, the shining uh, background, here, uh, just the one lamp. Uh, but hopefully uh, uh, you'll be intrigued by uh, our um, uh, slides. Uh, and actually, uh, it's, uh, it's really nice. Uh, thank you, Mika, as well, for your, for your talk. Uh, and thank you all for, for being here. Um, to, to link up to the previous talk, um, even though uh, we come from a very different angle um, and discuss a, a, a very different topic, um, there, there is some similarity in that um, we also uh, discuss the awareness of language choices and the, uh, the power that um, uh, translators have by making particular choices. Um, also uh, wanting, in the end, of course, uh, introspection by uh, translators, and in this case, literary translators. Uh, so what uh, uh, Letty and I decided to do, we um, have split our um, presentation into two parts. Um, I'll be doing the close reading, and Letty <laughs> will be doing the number crunching that we did. Um, because um, uh, we looked at uh, Gatsby um, uh, as a case study uh, in terms of retranslation. This is um, uh, quite rare in the Netherlands, actually, um, even uh, whilst uh, in other countries there are many, many retranslations of canonical literary works. This is not the case in the Netherlands. It's very rare that a book gets translated twice. Um, and uh, it's only the canonical works that uh, get a retranslation. Um, also, so there is a scarcity of research into uh, Dutch retranslations. Re um, so even though um, people in the past, uh, or over the, over the past few years have said, uh, we should move away from just case studies, we decided actually to do a case study uh, because it, like uh, Koskinen and Palaskowski uh, say, that opens up uh, new roads uh, uh, and, a, and a bigger picture if we uh, contribute with uh, several case studies. Um, our case study is also um, uh, focused on one particular um, issue that has not been researched a great deal, and that is the effect of retranslations. Um, as Elstad and Aziz Rosa mentioned in their uh, seminal 2015 paper, um, uh, the effect of retranslations is hardly uh, researched. So this calls for uh, uh, more research into that area, and we picked one of our favourite novels uh, to do so. But first, let's look at um, uh, the way that we went about it. First, we um, uh, did a close reading of uh, canonical text, and then we went into a reader uh, response. Uh, we, we did a reader response survey. Um, and of course, it's very important then to have a look at what do we actually define as the reader? This is something that is sometimes taken for granted in the literature, what a reader is. And most of the time in, um, in translation studies, the reader um, is the ideal reader or the implied reader. Um, um, the ideal reader being usually a critic or a translator or a reader that um, has a lot of knowledge about uh, uh, literature. Um, so that's the ideal reader rather than maybe a lay reader as Hickey defines it, uh, someone who just picks up a book to enjoy it or to get something out of it ra rather than, than study it, as it were. Um, and that brings us to the question, of course, uh, of uh, reception or response uh, research. Uh, how do you define reception? How do you define response? Is reception the way that uh, a work is uh, critically reviewed? Um, acclaimed, uh, discussed in, uh, in the media, or is it the response of individual real lay readers, the actual readers? And we decided that 
in terms of the effect of translation choices, it would be um, uh, best to look at those lay real readers. And uh, that um, led us to a, quite a complex um, intertwining of uh, uh, various strands in, uh, in reading. First of all, of course, when you read a, a, a novel, you get a certain slice of society. And with that, you also come across stereotypes in society. Um, these stereotypes in society actually are embedded in the fiction that you that you read. There is no one, uh, uh, no novelist that doesn't take their own background and baggage and, and views that they put into fiction. And so stereotypes are an integral part of uh, literary works. Now, of course, if uh, stereotypes are prevalent in fiction, they may also be prevalent in translation. And um, the uh, translations, uh, people who read translated works, of course, will have particular perceptions of, uh, in this case, uh, women in society. Uh, this is the, uh, the issue that we looked at. We looked at female characters in translation. And um, we looked at one particular work, The Great Gatsby, which is interesting because um, Gats uh, uh, Fitzgerald, the author himself, uh, often uh, said about himself that he, was, he had a feminine mind. And of course, um, I, I don't know whether uh, everyone knows The Great Gatsby, um, it's uh, about a, a, a mystical figure uh, called uh, Gatsby, and uh, he's madly in love with uh, a woman, or he adores someone from the past. Uh, and uh, so these two protagonists are uh, Gatsby himself and uh, the, uh, the girl that he, he is still pining for called Daisy. And uh, Daisy, uh, even though Fitzgerald claims to be a feminine mind, puts various stereotypes uh, into Daisy. Although uh, we may ask ourselves, are those stereotypes put in by Fitzgerald, or are these the stereotypes that we make out of the language that he uses? Because um, if we look at Fitzgerald's work, um, it's quite um, uh, hard to read between the lines. He uses very ambivalent language uh, in most cases. Maybe the, uh, the readers, whether they be translators or the actual readers, that probably work his um, uh, ambiguous language into something that uh, with their, their own uh, uh, preconceptions and biases. So we looked at two Dutch translations, published one in uh, 48, so uh, quite a, um, uh, more than 20 years after the uh, Great Gatsby itself came out, and uh, a retranslation in 1905 by Janssen uh, with a revised edition, and we looked at those two, uh, two retranslations. And uh, what we found out in our close reading is that the decisions made by the translators, whether it be conscious uh, in a conscious way or unconsciously, present Daisy, the main female character, uh, in a more negative light than the source text actually does. Um, uh, Daisy's characterization um, is different in the source text than it is in the uh, translations. And therefore, of course, the uh, reception by readers of this particular female character will differ from the original work. And if we look at the two translations, especially the first one paints a picture of Daisy that is much more manipulative, a manipulative uh, woman who beguiles uh, Gatsby. Uh, she's seen much more as a temptress um, than, uh, than a coquettish woman. Um, and uh, all the ambiguity that is there in the original seems to have disappeared, especially in the first translation, not so much in the 
1985 translation, but uh, uh, a great deal in the 48 translation. And so what we did in terms of uh, our research, we looked both at translator behavior and reader reception. So the focus for us was on uh, reader's perceptions of female character in translation and retranslation and the effects of those choices on characterization. Uh, the method that we used uh, for uh, this paper uh, was a reader response survey. Uh, like I said, uh, we looked at one particular female character, uh, specifically Daisy Buchanan, and these are the um, character traits and characteristics that she is often uh, attributed with. Uh, Daisy is often called shallow, materialistic, selfish, careless, manipulative, flirtatious, insincere, <clears throat> weak, insecure and helpless. So quite a list. Um, what we did is um, we, we grouped those things together. And to give you an idea, a little taster of uh, what we looked at, uh, yes, the next slide would come in <laughs> handy, is um, um, we, we looked at the original, then we um, uh, where uh, a, a certain characteristics came about in the original itself, and we looked at the way that it was translated. So let's have a look at uh, that was a way she had. The uh, male character uh, is looking at Daisy, uh, who um, makes him always feel like he is the most important person in her life. Um, and uh, it's translated uh, as, dat was een van haar maniertjes, or that was zo een maniertje van haar. So rather than uh, that was a way she had uh, which is fairly neutral, she did this regularly, she often acted like this, it becomes a mannerism, so much more negative in translation. The same is true for the other example. Um, mm. At a certain point, uh, Daisy uh, tells uh, the others uh, uh, present in a scene that um, her husband, who's quite a bully, um, has hurt her finger and she looked at it, it with an awed expression. Uh, now, if you look at the word awed itself, it is a, a mixture of fear and wonder. But in the uh, Dutch translations, the first one is a solely uh, frightened expression and the second one is dismay and horrified. So she seems much more uh, someone who is a a, a, a drama queen rather than neutrally saying, um, I'm afraid and uh, um, I look at it uh, with a kind of be bewilderment. Um, and of course, we were very curious uh, to see whether readers, unlike ourselves, because we are both translators and translation scholars who do close readings, we were wondering what uh, real readers would say about these particular translation choices. And so uh, uh, in the next part, uh, Letty will tell uh, you more about the reader response survey uh, that we conducted. Yes, um, and I apologize in advance for my children who are screaming in the next room and I hope they stay in the next room. Um, so as soon as you start doing reader response uh, surveys, the problem is um, you want to look at actual readers, but who is the actual reader? Because readers are vastly um, diverse. So did we want um, adult readers or young readers? Uh, so teenagers, for instance, who have to read The Great Gatsby in high school. Do we want men and women? So um, the problem is deciding who the real reader is. Um, the problem for academics is usually that you end up with your own students and uh, they're not really natural readers anymore, especially if they're studying translation literature or linguistics. Um, so we asked our own students from the MA in translation to send our survey to people over 30, trying to avoid um, too many students in the sample. And then we asked them to try and um, send it to people in different uh, geographical areas of the Netherlands, uh, from different cultural backgrounds and from different educational levels. 
Um, and in the end, uh, that worked quite well. But that is always the first uh, hurdle in doing reader response. Who is my actual reader and how generalizable and how representative will my data be? Um, so what we asked them to do, um, we wanted to examine whether the readers of the older translation, so the 1948 translation, had a, had a more def, uh, negative view of Daisy than the readers of the 1985 translation. So we gave them a web-based survey, and in the first part, um, we gave them seven short fragments of only one or two sentences um, in turn, and we asked them, just give us uh, five words that describe your spontaneous reaction to the female character in these fragments. We told them they were fragments from a famous novel, but we didn't tell them which novel. And we tested on our own students if they recognized the novel and they didn't. So we chose sentences that are um, not easily recognizable as uh, being from The Great Gatsby. Um, so they gave us five words and their spontaneous responses to seven uh, fragments. And then for the second part, we gave them the seven fragments again. But now we asked them to score Daisy Buchanan on 12 characteristics. So we asked them, uh, can you tell us if you find the female character uh, sincere, helpless, manipulative, confident? And we asked them to say, um, we asked them to score this on a, a Likert scale going from one uh, I don't find her, um, I don't think that she has this characteristic at all, to five, I think that she really has this characteristic. Um, and we wanted to see if the, the very subtle lexical differences between the two translations uh, influenced how people re reacted spontaneously and then scored Daisy's characteristic. And we were assuming that the negative, uh, the more negative opinions would be uh, when readers saw the 1948 edition. So they only saw one translation. So all of the fragments were either from the 1948 translation or they were all from the 1985 uh, translation. Uh, in the end, 103 participants took the survey and completed it. 67% um, uh, were female and 33% were male. And that's a, a common problem in doing any kind of response study. It's usually women that respond, not men. Uh, so if you want to have a more carefully balanced sample that takes more time to actually uh, find male participants. Um, no one specified as other or did not want to specify. Most of the participants were between 31 and 60 uh, with only two being younger than 30, so that technically they were on the, the, they were 30 exactly, I think, so marginally acceptable, and uh, 15 were older than 60. And in terms of reading behaviors, we found that 41% um, indicated that they read three to 10 novels per year, and about 20% never read anything, uh, about 20% read one to three novels per year, and about 20% um, read uh, more. So they were um, the three um, lower scoring and higher scoring um, groups were about equally spread. So now it gets very statistical. So I'll just go through this uh, rather quickly because I don't know how much you hate statistics, but it was quite a struggle for Katinka and me to do this. Um, <laughs> We ran an independent samples t-test in SPSS to see if there were statistically different uh, statistical differences between the scorings for those 12 characteristics between the two versions. And we found that actually there were only two characteristics that showed us a significant difference in the scoring. So only for confident and for helpless, we found that there was um, a significant difference, namely that readers of the retranslation, so the older translation, uh, the newer translation, found Daisy more confident, so that's a more positive interpretation, and they found her less helpless, so again, mm -hmm. a, a more positive interpretation. So this confirmed our idea that um, the 1985 retranslation was more positive in its presentation of Daisy uh, to the reader, and indeed the readers found. Um, had a more positive view of her in terms of confidence and helplessness. Um, and then 
for the others, we didn't find any significant interaction. But when we looked at the spontaneous responses, uh, we did see patterns in the lexical choices that the readers made in describing uh, that female character. Um, many spontaneous um, responses um, mentioned negative personality traits for both translations, actually. We found that even with seven very short fragments of only one, two sentences, people immediately started calling her shallow, manipulative, weak, insincere, pushy, uh, a gold digger, a man eater. So we found that quite um, um, scary in a way. Uh, but then again, people's um, perception of characters is probably different when they read the entire novel. So it's, it's also uh, difficult to generalize this because they saw only fragments and not an entire personality as it develops throughout the novel. Uh, but it is interesting to see how quickly people jump on the negative interpretation uh, wagon. Um, readers of the older translations of the 1948 one did see Daisy as more helpless, more insecure and frightened. And that's probably because of lexical choices such as uh, the odd expression becoming angstig. Um, and readers of the 1985 were united in their spontaneous responses, considering her cynical rather than helpless, and actually quite tragic and fatalistic, um, which is, I think, much closer, and Katinka agrees with me, I see her nodding, uh, that's a much closer interpretation to what the source text is trying to do. Uh, she is, in a sense, very much a victim of her own time. She can't behave any differently because uh, society forces her to behave like this. Uh, the readers of the retranslation actually did find Daisy more manipulative, and the trans readers of the older translation found her more uh, tempting. But it was also difficult, we found, sometimes to interpret the spontaneous responses. So we saw, actually, that uh, flirtatious was mentioned a lot, but sometimes it was used in combination with other words that were clearly negative, and sometimes it was used in combination with words that were clearly positive. So that's also a societal change, whereas being flirtatious was probably something people frowned upon uh, 30, 40, 50 years ago. Um, many young people these days might actually see it as, a, as, a, as something that powerful, confident women do. They're flirtatious because they're, they're confident enough that it won't harm, um, harm them in any way. So uh, problems with this kind of study, uh, there's a lot of data and it's very messy because people don't always do what you expect them to do. And sometimes what they tell you is very hard to interpret. Um, but we did feel that both the scores and the re spontaneous responses gave very interesting insights into how people go about interpreting what, uh, what characters in a novel are like. So how do they go through this process? And it would actually be very interesting if we can find a way to to kind of see how that develops through the novel. So if they read longer uh, stretches of text. Uh, we do feel that translated decisions may indeed affect characterization and uh, influence how readers interpret, uh, especially female characters. Um, so as a final thought, um, we now encourage our own students and the literary translators around us to uh, reflect more consciously on how such very small subtle lexical decisions may actually influence uh, gender stereotyping um, and to avoid making decisions that might not be warranted based on the source text. Um, and we would like to encourage fellow scholars to study how readers respond to translations and retranslations and to see how what they do and what they uh, express um, either confirms or rejects uh, common stereotypes so that we can get a clearer picture of whether those stereotypes are part of the, the original, the translation, or they're ex actually external and we bring them to the text. So they're not uh, prompted by the translation or by the original novel, but we actually bring those uh, stereotypes with us as we approach uh, um, the translation or the original. And thank you for your attention and for staying so long on a Friday afternoon. <laughs>
Thank you very much. I see that we have uh, questions already in the chat box. So I will uh, read uh, Pete's question. Did you see a distinction between the answers of male and female readers? I think you answered that in your presentation. Were male female readers more sensitive to the weakness of Daisy? I think you did see some patterns, Katinka, right? When you were going through all of those responses. Yes. Uh, um... The actually the male readers on the whole were um, uh, slightly more positive about Daisy, um, uh, but they did find her more of a flirt. Um, and like Letty said, that was a very hard one to um, uh, to take on board because the flirtatiousness was sometimes in the uh, spontaneous responses was sometimes combined with. Um, uh, character traits and sometimes the negative. So this is uh, the problem of these uh, messy data that spontaneous response uh, gives. But on on the whole, um, we thought that the uh, that the uh, female respondents were slightly more uh, were were harsher in their uh, view of Daisy than the than the male respondents generally speaking yes and we, and, we, and we still have to to zoom in on, um, on on this we did also run the same statistics mm -hmm. to see if there was a significant Thank difference between answer. the male and female scores um, but that was insignificant so in terms mm -hmm. of finding statistically significant differences there were no uh, differences between male and female scorings uh, but when you look at the words they used, and we still want to do a follow up where we actually go into all of the spontaneous responses, we did have a feeling that they chose different words. That yes. the men actually made different lexical choices in their responses. So a very yeah. interesting follow up. <laughs> yeah. um, and, and also, it's, I think it's important to, to, to mention the fact that uh, they did not know it was a translation. So uh, we didn't mention the fact that this was a, a originally an American novel, uh, nothing in terms of the background. We just said, this is a female character. All of the sentences that you'll be reading are from, are about, or uh, the, the, this female character are um, the things that the female character says. Anyway, you conducted a very interesting uh, survey. And uh, while I was listening to you, I, uh, uh, I had myself uh, two questions. What is the risk of partial material selection? Uh, because you said yourself that uh, you selected uh, one or two sentences in each fragment. So maybe even there is a partial uh, material that you served uh, to, to the, to, in the survey. And the other uh, question I was wondering, um, uh, whether you have asked to your uh, uh, interv uh, uh, to, to, to your um, interviews, uh, have they seen the films? And have they been uh, maybe um, influenced sub uh, subconsciously uh, by the characters that the directors uh, have imposed in a certain way? And that's, that's why we checked if they recognized the novel and none of our students recognized it. Um, so we're hoping that the movie didn't influence their interpretation beca because they didn't recognize which book it was. Yeah. Uh, okay. That was okay. our hope. Um, and as mm. for the sentences, that's, it, that is the point. Um, I think that is the problem with this kind of research. Uh, why we did it this way is because we were hoping, um, we were looking for particular lexical items in those fragments and the smaller the fragments, the the better we could see if their responses matched lexically to the word we were interested in. Um, what we would actually like to do, but we need help from someone who knows how an eye tracker works, is to see if they linger on those particular words when they read the, uh, the fragments. So we wanted to give them longer fragments and then see if their, uh, their gazes, um, um, they have longer uh, gaze um, duration for those words that we're interested in. So do they actually linger on angstig and then tell us, oh, she's very frightened. Um, but <laughs> both Katink and I can't do eye tracking yet. So if anyone in the room knows how to do <laughs> eye tracking, <laughs> please contact us. 
Um, and actually, um, in relation to the last question, um, Katinka spent weeks, if not months, trying to find out if Cornelis was a man or a woman. And we both yes. convinced that it was going to be a man. But both the sad translations were women. Yeah. Um, this this was quite interesting. The, uh, and this seems to be the case in, in the Netherlands a lot. Um, uh, nowadays, from, from say the 1970s onwards, uh, translation uh, tr uh, seems to be a, a proper profession. Um, and uh, uh, before that, it seemed to be a kind of hit and miss whether people did this for a living or simply because they uh, they moved in the right circles. So this translator, Lily Cornelius, was actually uh, probably, and this is our educated guess, I'm still going through, uh, through her letters, um, um, only chosen as the translator because she was married to um, uh, a professor uh, who was also a writer and moved in circles of uh, writers and scholars. Um, she was uh, actually um, um, uh, uh, an, uh, an artist herself, rather than uh, uh, a linguist or, uh, or a translator. Um, and the only reason why uh, I found out that, she, uh, that, that, that it was a she was because, uh, because of the, 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 the letters that she sent in the Second World War to her, uh, to her then husband. Really interesting. <laughs> yeah, and it's but but it's uh, that's the case for a lot of translators. Very very hard to to find uh, to to find out any data about their personal lives uh, and even uh, uh, their uh, uh, their sex or gender um, uh, before 1950. Say for yeah. quite a few translators. And I can imagine that, uh, uh, as in Croatia, that uh, even in the Netherlands, uh, before uh, the translators uh, were mostly male uh, translators, and then that nowadays uh, the, it's opposite. At least it's in Croatia is uh, that way. That uh, the most of uh, literary translators uh, translators today in Croatia are female. Yeah, I've noticed that when when you look at classics, it's often men again. So the mm -hmm. Dostoevsky, the newest Dostoevsky translation is bound to be by a man, or the newest Shakespeare. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I think it's mostly a female profession these days in the yeah. Netherlands. Yes. Do we have some other questions uh, from the audience? I think everyone needs a drink. <laughs> Everyone needs a drink. So uh, I would re really like to thank you all for this rich uh, panel. Uh, really, you gave us a lot of um, uh, food for thought and uh, it was really very fruitful. Uh, a lot of paths to investigate further.